Yeah. Hey, Spider. It's hyperactive. How's life? How are the animations going? Fine, I guess. I got an idea for a new video. Are you interested? Um... Oh, no. I kind of got stuff to do. Maybe some other time? Oh, well, that's fine, I guess. I'll find someone else to debate with. Debate what? Resident Evil 7 compared with Outlast 2. But that's fine, I'm sure someone else can. God, do you want him? Then you'll have him. What? I mean, yeah, dude, I'm down for it. Resident Evil 7 begins with Ethan Winters traveling to Dolberry, Louisiana after receiving a message from his presumed dead wife for three years to come get her. Arriving at the Baker's resident, our numbskull cardboard cutout protagonist walks into the spooky residence to have a heartwarming reunion with Mia. You're not hot anymore. Oh! Oh! So this is what a masochist relationship looks like. After receiving a lovely hand job, Ethan saw put to return the favor by unloading into her multiple times until she becomes unconscious. But then Ethan's fisted by daddy. Okay, I'm done with the sexual innuendos. Ethan wakes up at a dinner table to see a dysfunctional family, the Bakers, eating disgusting dinner. I see Capcom has been watching the average American Thanksgiving dinner. Luckily for Mr. Brown Pants Winters, an officer arrives to distract the crazed undead hillbillies except for the old lady who just stares at Ethan the entire time. <laughs> Ethan escapes and gets a phone call from Zoe. Zoe is also a baker, but her sanity hasn't walked out on her just yet. She wants to work with Ethan on getting out alive and creating a cure for the virus that's coursing through her and Ethan. First half of the story is simple by focusing on escaping, making a cure, and saving your wife and encountering the Bakers. Through the first half, you learn more about Zoe and understand her reasons why she wants to leave this paradise. It becomes heartbreaking when you must decide to save your crazed grudge wife denying Zoe her freedom or divorce Mia and escape with Zoe. Either choice has its consequence in determining what ending you get. The second half of the story has you playing as Mia because good old Mr. Stale Winters slipped into a mini coma. Mia is constantly encountering the little creepy girl that strongly resembles the girl from Fear, but less rapey. Here we found out the truth about Mia's dark past, the little girl, Evelyn, intentions, and the fate of the Bakers. Mia told half-truth to Ethan. It was true that she was babysitting, but she didn't mention she was babysitting a little girl that can create stumbling mold creatures and affect other living organisms. I can see why she wanted to leave that out. Apparently, Evelyn grew attached to Mia and chose Mia to be part of her growing family using forced adoption. The Bakers just happened to be poor saps that encountered Evelyn. If you thought choosing between Zoe and Mia was simply tugging at your heart, then the next reveal is stabbing it. Jack Baker explains through a flashback, they are not in control of their own actions and they are good people. He begs Ethan to free his family by loading Evelyn's skull with hot lead pellets. To sum up the rest of the story, Mia sacrifices herself, or not because she still has a grudge over the divorce. You head back to the Baker's resident to confront Evelyn who turns out to be the old lady the entire time. But turns out this isn't her final form. She transforms into a giant monster that would give Godzilla a rough time. Hope seems to be all lost, but thanks to Deus Ex Machina, you receive the deadliest weapon, a pistol. Turns out to be enough to kill the monster, and that's quite embarrassing, don't you think? A soldier comes over to you and takes off his helmet to reveal a big plot twist. Chris is working for Umbrella. This is explained in the Not A Hero DLC. Outlast 2 follows the new cool kid reporters Blake Langerman and his wife Lynn, who are investigating the brutal murder of a young pregnant woman. They take a helicopter to middle of nowhere Arizona, where a bright light causes them to crash for no apparent reason. Blake wakes up to find his wife missing, dead corpses, and religious nutjobs chasing after him. He finds out the Bible thumpers are into some fucked up shit. Dead baby pile, anyone? We are soon introduced to our first two major baddies, Papa Noth, the deranged pastor who believes the Antichrist is coming, and Marta, his murderous follower and superfan. 
As Blake continues to look for his wife through the single worst backwards town in Arizona, Papa Noth announces through a convenient PA system that Lynn is captured and pregnant with the Antichrist. Who he intends to kill. After finding Lynn, they try to escape only to have Lynn kidnapped by the heretics and their leader Val, who actually want the Antichrist to be born. So now Blake has to go to their base in the spooky non-union mines to rescue her, meeting the diseased fanatic Laird Byron on the way and enduring all manners of backcountry hell and bullshit to get to her. The mysterious flashes of light keep happening and oh by the way did i mention that blake starts to fucking hallucinate yeah he has these pseudo flashbacks of his childhood in catholic school with a monster that looks like the deleted scenes version of the thing it also features his childhood friend jessica they allude at first that she killed herself but we discover through multiple flashbacks up until the end that father loudermilch has been molesting her and when she tried to run away he broke her neck and made blake lie about her cause of death to the police strongly hinting that Louder Milch was the monster from the other flashbacks. Oh, and before I go any further with the ending and the YouTube comments start pouring in about how Outlast 2's story sucked because it wasn't even related to the first one, let me clear that up real quick for people who didn't pay attention or didn't investigate a particular part. <laughs> At a certain part of the game, Blake found a document strongly suggesting the involvement of the Murkoff Corporation from the first game. The note discovered talks about how some scientists are sending signals into the town to experiment and fuck with their heads, showing that the Wall Rider project and morphogenic engine from the first game was being used on these religious hicks, making them ultra crazy and causing Blake to hallucinate. Anyway, Blake rescues Lynn, who is now super preggers. The heretics in the Noth Squad battle, and our main characters are saved from Martha by a literal miracle. When Lynn gives birth and Blake holds the child, she comments, there's nothing there before dying. By the way, there are further connections between Outlast 1 and Outlast 2, shown in the free online Outlast comics from the official Red Barrel site, explaining that women exposed to the morphogenic engine experience phantom pregnancies, which would give them some explanation to Lynn's sudden and fast baby bump and why she saw nothing being held in Blake's arms. Noth shows up and slits his own throat for failing to stop the Antichrist from being born, and Blake steps outside with his hallucination baby, and the game ends with a vision of the biblical apocalypse. So, how do we determine a winner? RE7 has a pretty good story, too. Yeah, but it's basic. It's for basic bitches. It's almost the same story! They're trying to find their wives and escape from hillbillies! Sure, on the surface it's the same, minus the hallucination sequence, but I'd argue in Outlast 2 there's more to uncover. Documents that show the Murkoff Corporation's involvement and that your hallucinations are another morphogenic engine experiment. The heavy religious themes, the regret of never telling the truth. There's always more to the story to discover. It has layers. Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. And I'd rather have something with that kind of replay value. Yeah, but half of that stuff to uncover is online, and not in the game. That's part of the point. You're an investigative journalist, in and out of the game. It makes you think. Okay, fine. You got this one. But there's nothing wrong with being basic. Not at all. <laughs> Resident Evil characters have always ranged from cartoon villains that have immeasurable resources to create endless number of sequels to campy one-liner heroes that are trying way too hard to be taken seriously. Resident Evil has embraced that mold by introducing intriguing and complex characters. The Bakers are easily the best part of the game. They outshine the main heroes and why I love this game. Each Baker is memorable and unique to one another. Jack Baker oozes with personality, but still has this intimidating presence. Holy cr oh god. god damn it. Ah. I don't know. Margaret Baker is outright creepy and disgusting, especially later on when she has a nest vagina. Lucas Baker thinks highly of himself and challenges you to jigsaw like death traps. Evelyn is just a creepy little girl that most horror medias like putting in, but she does her job well and it's effective. Yes, I love the adversaries more than the heroes, but it doesn't mean they are forgettable. Mia is the driving force of the story. She may at first seem like a damsel in distress, but she has moments of going full grudge girl and has dark secrets. This creates conflict in the player if they truly want to save Mia or save Zoe Baker instead someone who has been helping the player and more open. You can understand Zoe's reason of wanting to escape from her home. 
Either choice is heart-wrenching. The only character that is lacking is Ethan Winters. He has the most disconnect from the players because he doesn't react properly to certain situations, like having his limbs chopped off or his wife becoming a psychopath. Ethan Winters is a forgettable character when compared to the rest. Blake is more of a talker than his silent predecessors Miles Upshur and Waylon Park, giving us a bit of personality. Admittedly, Blake and Lynn don't have an abundance of character. They're like vanilla wafers. But the focus of character in Outlast was always more on the outside threats and less on the protagonist, so the player can easily insert themselves into the narrative. The more vibrant and terrifying characters in Outlast 2 are closer to environment pieces, but still impactful as good elements of horror, especially the religious aspects of their characters. Papa Noth, a bloated, corrupt, self-hailed holy man. His practices are more similar to the tactics of infamous cult leaders who required death, sex, and suffering in the name of the Lord. Creepy and unnerving on more levels than one. Marta, pious in a fucked up way, she wanders around looking for sinners with her cross scythe thing, muttering scripture under her breath. The easiest phrase I could think of to describe her is murder nun. Val, God doesn't love you. Not like I do. There's something particularly disturbing about that phrase, but there isn't a better sentence to sum this character up. Believing in the coming Antichrist and actually wanting it to happen. Val is the heretic leader of excess, decay, depravity, and filth. The idea that wretchedness is salvation. She's a freak. A fucking freak. Laird and Nick. Nick is really more of a silent, deformed mount, with Laird being the more deformed talking writer. Laird leads the Scald, diseased outcasts still faithful to Noth. And you know what? Fuck him! Seriously, Laird nails you to a goddamn cross because his diseased brain believes that after Blake dies and rises, his flesh will cure them. So, uh, cannibals too. Louder Milch. And the hallucinated demon form, terrifying and creepy in a skin crawl kind of way. Multiple hands and an inhuman tongue to grab you. If ever there was an avatar of a literal rape monster, this would be it. As his priest self, he's just as disturbing. It is an overused trope, sure, maybe, but in the context of the story, it does its job. Jessica, not so much of a horror character, but it's more of what her hallucinated screaming and dead body represent. An innocent, kind, and devout life taken far too early by an evil man who was supposed to be pious. The guilt her image gives Blake because he never told the truth about her death. The kind of thing that makes someone question, if our holy leaders are evil, is the flock lost? I'm okay with the cardboard cutout characters of Blake and Lynn. I'm okay with not connecting too much to their characters. Maybe Blake should have been silent like Miles, but it's all right because they're more like canvases for the more colorful characters. It's a fucked up painting. It looks like the creep factor of the characters is about equal here. Ty? Nine Tie Spider. The protagonists of RE7, Ethan, Mia, and Zoe, are far more interesting in the game makes you care about their survival more than the protagonists of Outlast 2. Yeah, but it's not like I don't care about Blake and Lynn. Would you rather save these guys or this pile of cardboard boxes? What do you care about more? It's no secret that Resident Evil 7's gameplay takes heavy inspiration from indie games like Outlast, but adds one major element that are only whispers to its world. It's black, made up of steel, has a reloading spring mechanism, and fires copper alloy around 768 miles per hour. It's called a gun. Despite having weapons, these undead rednecks are quite resilient and can only be killed in determined areas. There are going to be plenty of times where you must decide whether you fight or flight because you need to keep a careful eye on your limited resources. Exploration even makes a welcome return. In the last two Resident Evil games, exploration is absent. Here it is very vital for you to explore every inch of the map to find much needed ammo, health, secrets, keys, and files. There are puzzles that demand the players to use their functional brain to solve. Functionality-wise, 
The controls are immensely responsive and not clunky. You aim at something, the bullet goes there. What makes the gameplay such a success in my eyes is that it captures everything great from the original games and puts a new perspective with much needed tweaks. However, the one aspect that hinders the franchise is still here, the backtracking. It's not as bad as the originals, but it still can be annoying having to run through the same areas over and over again. The Outlast series so far has succeeded on the principle of run, hide, or die. This game isn't much different from the first, meaning no weapons, but for a horror game that's actually great because the feeling of being just powerless enough is horrifying. You can't kill any of these freaks, but they can kill you. Unlike the first game's protagonist, Blake seems to have missed this cardio because the ability to run indefinitely was discontinued for this game. Blake can get tired and slow down, so a decision to bolt for an exit instead of getting into a hiding spot is calculated. In most areas, you have to figure out how to get to the next destination without being caught or detected. The hallucination sequences are more of sprinting areas or discovering more of the Jessica story to get out. Stealth and quick thinking when you're caught was always key. And it seems they've amped up the enemy AI from the last game because dying and figuring out a different path is common in certain areas. Your camcorder is still your best friend and adds more great creepy visuals, but not as many jump scares as the first game. The new mechanic added was the voice detection through your camcorder, which allows you to hear enemies through doors, far away or around corners, so you can decide whether to wait for them to pass or see if the coast is clear. It suffers a bit from unclear paths to take, but the way I process that frustration is through believing that the whole point of the game is to be stressed because psychopaths are chasing you and oh my god, there is no time. I mean, they both play really well. Yeah, like, really well. Problem is the fine tuning comes down to preference. Do you like survival horror with guns or survival horror without guns better? We can't declare a winner based on something subjective, can we? No, wouldn't be ethical. Um, Ty? Ty. There is no denying that Resident Evil 7 looks outstanding. The new re-engine does tremendous work for detailing the atmosphere, lighting, and character models. If you were to compare the visual style to the other Resident Evil games, Resident Evil takes more of a dark, drabby color scheme, giving a great sense of foreboding, despair, and history. There is one visual style that I think is brilliant, and it's the Baker's design. They wear colorful clothing showing they have personalities, and this is a great contrast to their dead gray skin. The only design I don't like is the mold creatures. Sure, the mold that infests the house is disgusting and its color scheme represents that death is nearby, but the creatures that come out of it look like black plush toys that accidentally went through the sewers. They move like they have cinder blocks around their feet and stumble every tiny object on the floor. Other than that, Resident Evil 7 is the best looking horror game of 2017. Dear God, it's beautiful. What else is there to say about a game made by an indie company that has triple A quality graphics? Everything is wonderfully textured and detailed, as big as the literal raining blood and as small as flies on a rotting cow carcass. The grungy character design really shines here in, well, everything. The characters blend in well with the tone of the diseased environment. They become another element of the town instead of things living in it. It's clear the visual style was meant to unnerve and disturb by taking religious icons and perverting them in the worst bloodiest ways possible. Every polygon and normal map looked to be crafted with love, if not dry humping lust to make a pretty game. Dude, you gotta give this to Outlast 2. It's grungy, it's dirty, it's- Hair physics. I'm sorry, what? Hair physics. RE7 had great looking hair. It's the extra bit that tips the scale. Lynn has her hair back for all of Outlast 2. The game still looks amazing, but look at Mia. Her hair moves naturally, looks great, and doesn't constantly clip into her shoulders. Dead hair dough.
I have always considered Resident Evil franchise to be a fun, campy B-horror movie style video game. But if given to the right visionaries, it can be truly something special. Resident Evil 7 feels like an entirely new horror game that has a Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibe to it in body horror. The first person view makes it easier to immerse yourself in a very thick, atmospheric horror game. You are constantly moving slowly on your toes for anticipation for the bakers. They are frightening to come across and with their own unique encounters, but as well hilarious. Sadly, they are the only ones that truly elevates Resident Evil 7 to horror status. Fighting the mole creatures in the first half of the game is insanely tense and terrifying because you have limited ammo, items, and health, but the later half turns into well, Resident Evil. You have firepower that overpowers most enemies and then you become old father that you will begrudgingly go through until you reach the next big showdown. Don't get me wrong, Resident Evil 7 is easily the scariest in the franchise and I look forward to the next installment. Anything can really qualify for the horror game genre with a few jump scares, gore, and dark lit hallways, but few games can make your skin crawl like this one. Among the graphics, lighting, and game mechanics that make your neighbors wonder where the screaming came from, the sound design is outright phenomenal. The ambiance it provides is enough to make you wonder if that sound in the bushes is a real threat or just background noise. Although, it's the overbearing religious theme that pulls all the working elements together. This is the hero of Outlast 2. Take it from someone who did Catholic school for nine years, the shit cray, and it's amazing. Even the stuff people just dismissed as general horror ambiance is tied together with heavy religious overtones. The water turning into blood, death of the firstborn, locusts, darkness covering the sun. Plagues of Egypt, anyone? But the heretical religious theme goes beyond the idea of a biblical fucking apocalypse. It's the idea of religion losing its way. A fear leading the faith, even if it's wrong reliving the worst of the torturous Old Testament and the horrifying thought that maybe the guy with the end is nigh sign was the one who was right. Will you get scared playing this game? Probably, but it's the aftertaste that will stay with you, make you uncomfortable, maybe a bit jittery or even disgusted. That's the point, because sometimes people forget that horror is mostly psychological, and if it messes with your head a bit, it's done its job. Black gooey toothy monster. Heretic man beasts. Regenerating sadistic hillbilly. Dick severing psycho nun. Bug nest vagina bitch. Literal rape monster. Fine. And the winner is. It's a tie. Outlast 2 and Resident Evil 7 are both amazing horror games that succeed better in different areas. While some of the themes and story may be the same, it's unique experience for either one. Great gameplay, beautiful graphics, and moments that will make you shit your pants. Individually, they are not perfect, but they are some of the best to offer from the horror genre. I guess what we learned today is that... What? It's... It's a tie, I thought. No, 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 no. This was a versus battle, Hyperactive. You don't get to rob me like this. There are no ties in a battle. Somebody dies and somebody goes home with glory. Yeah, but now we get to share the glory. You idiot. You misled your audience. They thought somebody was going to win. Now everyone is going to unsubscribe. No, disregard that, everyone. Don't subscribe. No, 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 no. She's, she's just joking. You fucked me over, Hyper. You fucked your viewers. You spit in the face of God with your heathen words. Spider, uh, dude, you okay? Please, just let's talk about this. Oh, God. God don't hear dead man. Take your penance. God loves you. God loves you. Ah!